So let me just start the recording on our side. And um, let's start. So we're very glad to have uh, to have you, Mathilde, uh, with, with us. So um, you're a PhD student at um, UC uh, Santa Barbara, um, and you will introduce us to topological deep learning and its architectures. And uh, we're very excited to learn about that. Great. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be virtually back at McGill. I've done quite a few hackathons, I think, in the room that you guys are in now. So kind of special to be back. I'm really excited to tell you about topological deep learning and the literature behind it. Uh, this work has come out of a literature review that we recently put out and got a huge response online. I think people are really excited about this field and see a lot of potential in this field. And it was really exciting to see so many people want to get involved. The day that it came out, it was the most popular archive link on uh, AI Twitter, which was crazy. And it made Hacker News, which was also really exciting. So hopefully I will summarize the uh, results of this literature review concisely over the next hour. I will go through an introduction and then build up a framework that we can use to systematically break down any topological neural network in the literature. And then we'll look at what the literature looks like to this current day. Okay, so to start explaining topological deep learning, I like to start with something that we might be familiar with called a graph neural network. So as you might know, in a graph neural network, a graph supports our input data. So all of our input data is represented on features on either nodes or edges of the graph. And at each layer of the graph, you are updating those features by, you can imagine, passing messages between the nodes. And this is maybe a little bit abstract. So let's draw a visualization of this message passing scheme. So let's say that your input features on your nodes are some colors and each color uh, represents whatever, some scalar. This is your first layer. When you pass messages, you're gonna send information through the edges of the graph in this case, and update the color on each node. And that becomes what your graph looks like at your second layer. And then you keep going with this process through multiple layers until you hit the last layer where information is aggregated across the graph into a single prediction. So that's the graph neural network. Graph neural networks have been very powerful and very popular in deep learning in the last years. However, they might not be the best choice for certain data sets. Um, and let me give you some examples. So what if you have a social network of individuals connected by relationships on some social media platform, for example, or a molecule with atoms connected by bonds? In both of these situations, pairwise relationships are very important to describing your graph, but also you have relationships that go beyond pairwise connections. What if you have a group of four individuals that all share something in common, that are part of the same group on social media, for example? A graph can't represent that type of information easily. You can only have pairwise connections, so telling your graph all of these four people share something in common is quite difficult. Similarly, in a molecule, a benzene ring is a very important piece of information to what your molecule can do, right? Whether or not your molecule has a benzene ring inherently changes its functionality. However, in a graph, you have no way of encoding that information directly unless you tweak your graph a little bit or change your input data. So instead, what if we had a domain 
beyond a graph that could encode these higher order relationships like benzenes or groups of people in a social network. And that's what a topological neural network is. So a TNN generalizes a graph neural network by representing higher order relations. So this is what a topological neural network can look like. In this situation, we have the same sort of message passing happening at every single layer, except now, instead of being constrained to pairwise relationships between our nodes, you can have a relationship that connects three nodes at a time. You can have a relationship that is higher rank than another relationship. And we'll get into what all of that means. But off the bat, I hope you can see how a topological neural network can be more powerful and more expressive than a graph neural network. Okay, so now why a literature review of topological deep learning? There are two big reasons for this. They're both sort of mass confusions that have hindered the accessibility of the field. The first mass confusion is the distinction with topological data analysis or TDA. Maybe you've heard of TDA before. It's been around for about a century and has been applied in machine learning for about the last five years. TDA is inherently a data processing method that has nothing to do with machine learning. So what people do is, for example, pre-process their data using TDA or will use TDA to help select a specific model uh, during training. But the model they're using inherently, the machine learning model that is being used, uh, remains mostly standard or classical. In parallel to the TDA field, deep learning on topological spaces or topological neural networks have started emerging in the last four years or so. And both of these fields are topological machine learning to some extent but it can be quite confusing to distinguish which is which. Hence the need for a literature review of the blue field. The second mass confusion is notation chaos. The field's mathematical inclination has made it so that a lot of papers come up with their own notation that is best suited to their own application. But what this means is that when you start reading the literature, Every single paper uses a slightly different notation. Um, all the notations on this slide represent the same thing, and nothing looks the same. So for a practitioner interested in using topological neural networks, this makes it really difficult to navigate the field. So through literature review, we hope to unify the field and make it very clear which questions have been answered and which questions have not been answered. OK. So on to the unifying framework. The goal of our framework is to clearly and categorically elucidate the topological domains and learning mechanisms in the literature. We're going to break this framework down into three parts. The domain of our neural network, its neighboring structures, and the message passing scheme. Let's start with domains. So I hinted at this earlier. A graph is a domain, but it is a traditional discrete domain. It only allows for pairwise relations, and it only allows for edges. In topological deep learning, we generalize this domain using more flexible higher order relations. And in particular, there are two kinds of relations that we can use to do this. Part whole relations allow us to add extra surfaces and volumes that are sort of geometrically constrained by edges. So for example, in a simplicial complex, you can add triangles that are bounded by three edges. And now your triangle is a feature of your topological neural network, just like the node is and just like the edge is. In a cellular complex, you have a little bit more flexibility in the sense that you don't need to have triangles only, you can have squares or any other shape. And you can imagine if we went in three dimensions, you could have cubes 
for example, um, inside of your complex, inside of your domain. The other relation is called a set type relation. In a set type relation, you can have any amount of nodes in one edge. So it's super flexible. Uh, the hypergraph that we have here, for example, has three nodes in an edge, four nodes in an edge. There are no constraints. However, you'll notice that in a hypergraph, we're still constrained to nodes and edges. We don't have access to surfaces, faces, or volumes. A combinatorial complex is kind of the holy grail because it combines both part-whole relations and set-type relations. So now we have all the flexibility of a hypergraph in the sense that any node can be connected to any node. And we also have this idea of rank, this idea of edges, surfaces, and volumes from part-whole relations. So this might sound a little bit abstract so far. So let's look at what these domains look like for real data sets. OK, so starting with part-whole relations, simplicial and cellular complexes are really powerful for data sets that have geometric structure. For example, if you have a molecule, you can represent the physical connections of your molecule, as well as the physical surfaces, like a benzene ring, for example, or cyclopropane of your molecule inside of your complex. These are also really powerful for meshes. So bottom left there is a mesh of a protein surface, and it's a simplicial complex because every single uh, face of the mesh is a triangle. In the cellular complex case, you could have a mesh with pentagons or octagons um, and be much more flexible. In the hypergraph case, we have an example of a protein network where you can have multiple proteins interacting through a hyperedge with multiple proteins. So maybe in a protein network, you want to encode the fact that proteins A, B, C and D are inherently connected in some way, but that doesn't necessarily imply that A and B are connected, B and C are connected, and C and D are connected. So you can skip the pairwise relations and just encode groups as singular relations. And then finally, the combinatorial complex is the most important um, domain in the sense that it's the most general. And here we have access to both the geometric relations. So for example, our molecule has geometric bonds that we're encoding, and we have access to the functional relations where we can encode the fact that a certain group of atoms is an amino acid, or a certain group of atoms is a carboxylic acid. And this can be really powerful uh, to encode both the physical nature of your molecule, but also the functional nature of it. OK, so now we have our domains. And say we've picked our domain for our data set. We say the combinatorial complex is what I need to encode all the important information on my data set. So the first step is to lift our domain. A lot of data sets you get will be only in graph format, for example. So during pre-processing, we will lift it into our combinatorial complex domain. And at that point, we feed it through a topological neural network. OK, so that was our domains. The next thing we have to figure out is how information travels over the domain. And this is encoded in our neighboring structures. Um, Matt, if I may, I have a question. Yes, about, absolutely. About this lifting procedure. So yeah. how is, is that done? I, I feel like maybe there's not a unique way to do it or there are subtleties. Absolutely. Yeah, there is There is no unique way to do it. Uh, there are a lot of, there's a lot of research actually as to what the best way to do it is. You have to be careful because for example, in the process of lifting into a graph into a simplicial complex, you don't want to be adding artificial relations in the sense that 
you could have a paper, right, that's written by three authors in a citation network. So in a citation network, this will look like three authors that have uh, one paper in common. So you'll see three edges. In a simplicial complex, that one paper becomes the surface connecting those three authors. However, you don't want to still have an artificial relationship between authors A and B that have never written a paper together. But sometimes in the process of lifting into a simplicial complex, if you're not careful, you can introduce these artificial features that didn't exist in the first place. So you definitely have to be careful. I think this is mostly, this, these lifting operations have mostly been done with citation networks so far and some protein uh, networks. A lot of people don't even use the higher order features. They don't even use like the, the surfaces or the faces or the volumes as input features, but rather they use them to be able to send messages with more flexibility on their domain. So you'll have a graph that is lifted into a higher order domain, but the edges or the faces or the volumes of that graph remain empty at input and are only used for computational purposes, if that makes sense. So there's a lot of different things that you can do and you're absolutely right. Uh, you have to be careful as to how you do it. I see, I see, makes sense. Um, I see there's a question or comment by Emmanuel in the chat. If you want, you can unmute uh, and, and ask it directly, whatever you prefer. Um, I, I can just read it. So okay. let's see. So uh, Emmanuel is saying, I'm guessing there's an exponential explosion of possible relationship. How does lifting look like in terms of computational complexity? Mm, that's a good question. Lifting in terms of computational complexity really depends on how you're lifting. And there's a lot of different ways that you can do it. But in general, if you're working with a data set that already has its shared relationships encoded. So for example, to come back to the citation network, if your nodes, you already see which authors, group of authors share a paper in common, then you don't need to go through all the possible nodes of the graph to know which ones are connected to which ones, if that makes sense. So kind of similar to a multimodal graph where you have types of data associated to each node, you can have uh, a topological domain that is aggregating information across nodes that already share similar types of information. Um, what I've seen so far in terms of like working with data sets is that the most complicated part, the, the biggest hurdle is not the computational complexity, but it's the decisions you have to make in terms of which uh, faces or surfaces should be given features and which should not. For example, in a mesh, do you put features on all of the triangles of your mesh or only on certain triangles, for example? And that's just sort of a decision the practitioner has to make. Does that I answer see your that. question? I think it's a great answer. So yeah, thank you. You can go ahead. Okay, great. So coming back to neighboring structures, these are going to lay out, you can imagine, kind of the roads that our messages can take on our domain. So for example, this benzene um, in this molecule might have the neighbors of all the other faces in the molecule, the two cyclopropanes and the other benzene ring. Or for example, this node on the right-hand side could have neighbors of the edges that are connected to the node. My point here is that the choice of neighborhood is pretty arbitrary. 
uh, and will seriously affect how your topological neural network processes information. So to encode these roads, we use something called a boundary matrix. Maybe you've heard of this before with graphs. The, another word for it is incidence matrix. In a boundary matrix, you're encoding the nodes or cells or whatever it is that you're looking at, in this case, the nodes that are on the boundary of the edges. So here in this hypergraph, we have two edges, AC and BCD, and we're encoding which nodes bound which edges. You can do the same thing with this combinatorial complex, for example, and you can do it for higher rank. So here we're encoding which edges are on the boundary of the AC face in our combinatorial complex. You can think of the boundary matrix as kind of a Lego building block that we will use to build up our neighboring structure. Specifically, there are four very common types of neighborhood structures that people use in the literature. And we'll go through all four and see examples of what they look like on a domain. So the first is the boundary uh, neighborhood structure, which somewhat obviously is simply the boundary matrix that I showed you before, where we are looking at the cells of lower rank that are on the boundary of our initial cell. So for example, the boundary of this edge Y are these two nodes X, and the boundary of this face are these edges. And then we have our co-boundary. So in our co-boundary, we're taking the transpose of our boundary matrix, and at this point, we're looking at all of the edges that have Y in their boundary, if that makes sense. So we're going up a rank instead of going down a rank. Another example is this face. So this face is co-boundary, sorry, this edge's co-boundary is this face. Okay. Now, the next neighboring structure is called our lower adjacent structure. And this is all the cells that share a boundary with Y. So for example, all of the edges that share a node that is also on the boundary of Y. Here, both of these faces share a boundary, or share an edge, with our initial face Y. And then the upper adjacent structure is similar, except now instead of going through the boundary, we're going through the co-boundary. So we're gonna go up a rank. These nodes share a co-boundary, i.e. are on the boundary of an edge uh, that Y is also on the boundary of. And then these edges are on the upper adjacent neighborhood structure of this edge Y because they share a co-boundary, they share a face with Y. So these are our four neighborhood structures, and that might have been a little bit dense, but basically all four neighborhood structures are just sets of roads that map possible ways for information to travel on your domain. Now we're going to use these neighborhood structures to build up our message passing scheme, which will specify exactly what information we're passing and how that information is manipulated as it travels along the neighborhood structures. Okay, so to make this really simple, let's pretend that our initial layer T, uh, we, we're gonna represent all of the features on the nodes as this dot, and we're gonna represent all of the information on the nodes as this dot for the next layer, and we're going to represent the operation that sends message from layer T to layer T plus one as just an arrow between those two dots. Okay, so there are three main categories of message passing, and this is exactly the same as for graph neural networks, so maybe you're even familiar with this figure. In the convolutional case, we are sending 
just linear multiplied versions of information on sending cells to our receiving cell. So C is some scalar that multiplies the feature on Y and sends that to X. Information is aggregated through summation. It's basically just a matrix multiplication. In the attentional case, we will weight information by some weight, uh, learned attentional weight, A. And in the general case, it doesn't even have to be some linear multiplication. So the possibilities are endless and we can also have attention in the general case. All right, so let's represent this with our little diagram that I showed earlier. So in the convolutional case, if we're sending message, uh, sending a message convolutionally, we'll just have a black arrow. And that's how we'll represent a convolutional message. In the attentional case, we'll represent it as a red arrow. And in the general case, we'll represent it as a fat arrow. And remember that attentional, the general case can also be attentional. Great. Now, how do we actually send the message through which roads? Well, that's our neighborhood structure, right? So we're going to specify our choice of neighborhood structure. Say we're sending information from nodes to nodes. Let's look back at our four possible options. In this case, there's only one thing we can do, and it's the upper adjacent neighborhood structure. So in the upper adjacent neighborhood structure, we will send information to all the nodes that share a co-boundary with our sending node Y. I would point out that this Laplacian is what you see in graph neural networks, if that means anything to you. So L up is just the regular Laplacian from graphs. Computationally, what this looks like is our weight matrix theta, which multiplies our initial feature on cell Y H, which multiplies our upper adjacent neighborhood matrix L up zero at indices X, Y. Let's look at another example. If we have edges sending information to edges, well, we could still use the upper adjacent neighborhood structure. In this situation, we'll be sending information through faces. Um, and the message passing equation looks very similar. But we can also send information through the lower adjacent neighborhood structure. In this situation, we'll be sending information through nodes that are on the same boundary um, as Y. Message passing equation still looks very similar, but notice now that we're sending information inherently to different parts of our domain. Okay, what if we're switching ranks? What if we're going, we're sending information from a node, rank zero, to an edge, rank one? There's only one neighborhood structure that can do this, and it is the co-boundary. So in this situation, we're sending information from a node to an edge, and this is what the message passing equation looks like. And that gives you an idea of the first step of message passing scheme. So the first step is to define the message, i.e. pick your type of message and pick your neighborhood structure. The second thing we have to do is aggregate information over our neighborhood. So what if I have multiple cells in a boundary that are all sending information to one cell? Well, I can either add all of these messages with just a simple arrow, or I can do something more complicated. I can take an average. I can take a weighted sum. In that case, we'll put a little banana to indicate that some aggregation more complex than a sum happened. OK. Now we have to aggregate information across multiple neighborhoods. What if, in your topological neural network, you're sending information both through a co-boundary and an upper adjacent neighborhood structure to the same cell. Well, you have to figure out how to aggregate those messages. So again, we can just decide to sum these messages, in which case we'll leave our arrows blank, 
or we can decide to do something more complicated, in which case we'll put another banana. And the last step is the update. The update function can be something as simple as a sigmoid, for example, that you send your last message through, or it can be something a little bit more complicated that depends on the feature initially on your receiving cell. So maybe you have some other weight matrix that will multiply your initial cell feature and add that to your new feature that you've aggregated from all of the neighborhood structures. This is a little bit dense. So I made this figure to visualize the four steps of the message passing scheme. So say we have some initial cell X, this node X, and we pick four neighborhood structures. So in this case, the first neighborhood structure is those three nodes. The second is all of those nodes. The third is the three edges. And the fourth is the three faces. So we've got our neighborhood structures. The first step is going to be in red, where we send information from each neighboring cell to our receiving cell. The second step is going to be aggregating over the neighborhood. So for example, summing information over all three nodes in the first neighborhood or all three faces in the fourth neighborhood. And then the third step is going to be aggregating information from all four neighborhoods by some aggregation function in green. And then the last step will be an update that occurs on the receiving cell. And again, the update can be something as simple as a sigmoid. Okay, so we've got our framework and now we can apply it to look at the literature. So this was our original goal, was to elucidate the topological domains and learning mechanisms in the literature. So to use our framework, let's divide up the literature into categories. Domains are the rows and learning mechanisms are the columns where you can either have a convolutional message or attentional or general message in gray. Let's start with the hypergraph domain. So the hypergraph domain is the oldest domain in topological deep learning. And the first, so for a while, what people did was collapse hypergraphs into graphs and then send the graphs through graph neural networks. But in that collapsing process, uh, they would lose a lot of important structural information about the hypergraph. So the first paper to preserve hypergraph structure and send it through topological neural network came out in 2020. And after that, people in the hypergraph community have done a really good job at generalizing graph results to hypergraphs. So an example of this is UniGCN2, uh, which generalizes GCN2, which is a graph neural network, to hypergraphs. And this is a really special neural network because it addresses the oversquashing problem, which is a big problem for graphs, just as, is it, just as it is for topological neural networks. And they showed that they could apply the same mechanisms in GCN2 to address oversquashing in hypergraphs. All set generalized hypergraphs to transformers, which is another example of generalizing important results from discrete traditional discrete domains to topological domains. And then the next domain that we get is the simplicial complex domain. The simplicial complex domain has strong roots in the signal processing community. So people in signal processing were thinking about simplicial complices a long time ago. And the first neural network that was trained on this domain came out in 2020. And you'll notice that in this neural network, it looks a lot like a graph neural network in the sense that nodes only send information to nodes, edges only send information to edges, and faces only send information to faces through mostly just Laplacian neighborhoods, which is characteristic of a graph neural network. Bunch came out with this neural network not long after, 
which unlike the first neural network is now sending information across different ranks, which turns out to be very powerful. So now our nodes are not only re receiving information from nodes, but also from edges. Um, and edges are receiving information from nodes, edges, and faces, et cetera. And then I'd like to point out high skip networks, which came out in 2022. High skip networks were the first network to have this sort of double neighborhood structure in one layer that is similar to the hypergraphs. So in this situation, in one layer of our topological neural network, we're sending information through a first set of neighborhood structures. So the node sends information to both nodes and edges, and then through a second set of neighborhood structures. So again, the upper adjacent neighborhood structure and then the boundary to take information back from edges to nodes. And as you can see, things get infinitely more intricate as you add neighborhood structures to your layer. I'd also like to point out attention in simplicial complex neural networks. Uh, this neural network specifically, SGAT, is the only topological neural network as of yet to be heterogeneous in the sense that it deals, it is capable of dealing with features of different dimensions. Um, and it's quite interesting that this has not been done more so far. Okay, in the cellular case, we have less, much less neural networks than in the simplicial and the hypergraph case. Uh, and you'll notice a lot of strong parallels with the simplicial case. So for example, this neural network with the two Laplacians on either side looks a lot like the simplicial network, uh, SCONE. This neural network has the same idea as BSCN net, where you're sending information from some rank K to any rank R uh, through this like pseudo neighborhood structure. And finally, I'd like to point out the only attentional neural network in the cellular domain so far, which again, looks a lot like uh, the top left attentional neural network in the simplicial case. And finally, our last domain is the combinatorial domain. There's one paper that has implemented this domain so far. So a lot of work remains to be done in terms of understanding this, the advantages of this theoretically much more expressive domain over uh, cellular and simplicial and hypergraph domains. And that's kind of an open question for, for the field to answer in the coming years, I hope. Broad comments on performance is that everyone agrees. So the hypergraphs, the simplicial, and the cellular networks all perform better than graphs at the tasks that they are trained on. So things like semi-supervised node classification, uh, link prediction, graph classification. However, you'll notice that there's very little interdomain comparison. So for example, within the hypergraphs, it is very difficult to know which hypergraph model performs better than another hypergraph model at the same task because the, the field is still very focused on benchmarking itself compared to graph neural networks. We hope to kind of address this with the literature review and hopefully give people some hints as to which models might be better suited to their task than another topological model in that same domain. So some example applications of what people have done. Link prediction is this idea of predicting a trajectory made up of edges on a map. Uh, map C at the bottom there is a map of Berlin where the dark spots represent obstacles in the city. And it turns out that a simplicial complex neural network is very powerful for encoding the topological structure of such a map and predicting trajectories that 
take into account the uh, obstacles that are encoded as topological features of a map. Another example of an application is classification of chemical compounds and proteins. Um, you'll see here that this simplicial complex attentional neural network does really well, uh, much better than state-of-the-art graph neural networks at classifying a uh, series of proteins and nitrate compounds, I believe, all kinds of things. Okay, so what are some open questions? Like I was saying earlier, we need better benchmarking. We need better data sets that are suited to topological neural networks and are not just lifted graphs that people are sort of arbitrarily choosing how to lift. And then we need a uh, better addressing of the oversquashing problem. This is an active area of research in graph neural networks and in topological neural networks. So far, we've only seen two uh, approaches at solving the problem. And finally, dynamic topological deep learning has been mostly done in the hypergraph community. So there's no neural network in the simplicial cellular or combinatorial cases that changes the domain at every layer. Um, and I would point out that dynamic graph neural networks are very common. Um, and lastly, while well, there's this idea of irregular domains, where, for example, you'll have a face that is not entirely bounded by edges, uh, but rather maybe just bounded by nodes. And right now, the computational methods that we use to send messages through neighborhood structures make such a domain kind of difficult to use, even though an irregular domain might be a much better representation of your data set. OK, so what if you think your data has some topological structure to it and want to use a topological neural network? Well, the first thing you want to do is identify the domain that you think is best for your data set. The second thing is looking at all the models that exist in the literature find, and finding one that is benchmarked, uh, ideally versus other models in that domain, and also suits your purpose. So in the literature review, we have this big table that tells you what every topological neural network has been trained to do, as well as its level of benchmarking. So in green are neural networks that do better at graph neural networks state of the art. And in pink are neural networks that have been proved to do better than topological neural network state of the art, uh, which is a more powerful statement. And you can see all of the different tasks uh, that people have trained their neural networks to do at the node level, the edge level, and the complex level. The next thing is understanding the message passing scheme. There are, of course, the tensor diagrams that I showed you today that you can kind of see what's going on just visually. But you can also check out our repo, Awesome TNNs, which encodes all of the message passing equations for all of the models in the literature review. So for example, these are all of the message passing equations associated to each hypergraph neural network. And you can see how many there are, and they're all classified, uh, they're all color coded by the color corresponding to the step in the message passing scheme. And the last thing I want to bring up is this uh, challenge that we just announced last week, uh, the Topological Deep Learning Challenge hosted at ICML. It is an awesome opportunity to get your hands on some topological neural networks. Uh, we are asking people to implement models that already exist in the literature using Topo Model X, which is a package uh, for building topological neural networks. And this is really exciting because if you participate, you're guaranteed co-authorship on a white paper and winners get the chance to co-author a submission to the Journal of Machine Learning Research. Uh, you don't need to be registered to ICML. You don't need to uh, have 
any experience in the field. We accept teams and the deadline is July 13th. So I really encourage you to check it out if you're interested in learning more about the field. And to conclude, we looked at what topological deep learning was, built up a framework, and then used that framework to break down the literature. Thank you. And I'm happy to take questions. So thank you. This was really an amazing talk. Um, we we learned a lot. Uh, and yeah, I have questions. Uh, first of all. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll start. Uh, so my first question would be, I, I saw that in your classification and in your, your survey, you did not include um, 